good morning, church. The topic of the message we are looking at this morning is what I call the end is near. The end is near. And I will try and explain to you what I mean by this. Um, the Bible says we should call those things that be not as though they were. And I'm sure when I say the end is near, um, by the time I tell you what I mean by it, some of you begin to wonder how. Well, like I said, Bible says call those things that be not as though they were. The end is near where it concerns poverty in your life. The end is near where it concerns failure in your life. The end is near where it concerns non-achievement in your life. What am I trying to say? All the problems of your life, they are about to expire. Let me hear somebody shout hallelujah to that. Now, looking at the present situation of the world and of the country, many of you may begin to wonder how can the servant of God be saying the end is near when it looks as if the problem has only just started. How am I going to survive this situation? I don't even know how the next one is going to come. It's just like the case of the story we read in Second Kings when there was famine and people had started killing each other's children. And the king sent word to Elisha. He said, look, what is going on? What are you going to do? And Elisha told the king and said, by this time tomorrow, the famine will be over. All this problem will have been over. And somebody said, what is this man talking about? There's not been rain for years, and then you are just saying that by this time tomorrow, even if you plant a seed today, you cannot harvest tomorrow. And then, so how can the famine be over? I know that's the way this situation may be looking to some of you. How can God says, or how can Santo God says that the end is near? when it looks as if I have not even started concerning based on the problem I'm facing right now. Well, the Bible made me to understand that with man, it looks impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And if you meditate on that word and you believe on that statement, then you will understand and believe if God says the end is near, that definitely the end is near indeed because there's nothing God cannot do. But let's go straight to the word and then maybe you will understand where I'm coming from. Like I said, I'm going to try as much as possible to explain these things to you uh, in a very simple way that you can understand. Uh, for those of you who are always in a hurry to judge and uh, try and determine where the message is going, I will advise you not to do that today. Just and not even at any point in time, because you never know which direction the world is going. So just listen and open your ears and ask God to give you understanding. This morning we are looking at the word of God, like I said, the end is now. And we are taking our scriptures from Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 to 30. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30. And this is the statement of our Lord Jesus Christ. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemies came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain has sprouted and produced a crop, then the tears also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tears? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then 
to go and gather them up. But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together unto the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Glory be to the name of God. Now, if you look at these scriptures very well, I'm sure for many of you, you may not, uh, using your own literally understanding of English, you can deem it to mean this or that. But there's more to it spiritually, which is what I want to try and explain to you this morning. Now, Jesus said, there was this man that planted seed in his farm. And while this man was sleeping, the enemy came and planted tears. He planted with. And when the enemy came, while the man was asleep, the enemy came and planted tears among the wheat. Man, the man planted good seed in his farm, seed of wheat. But the enemy came while the man was asleep and planted tears and then disappeared. And then the owner, the servants of the owner of the farm came and told the owner, Sir, come. Someone had come to plant tears alongside with the wheat the seed of the wheat that you are planted. We notice some strange tears growing with the wheat, and this is not part of what you planted. Or did you plant the tears as well? And then the owner said, of course, no, I didn't do such. And then he replied, him, definitely an enemy must have done this. So the servant said, okay, so what do we do? Should we go and uproot the tears from disturbing the wheat from growing properly? And the owner said, no, you don't do that. Because if you do that in the pressure of raising the tears, you uproot the wheat as well. So my advice is let it all grow together. When it's time for harvest, uh, we'll separate. Now, why would the owner of the farm say that? Why? I mean, it's common sense that if something is going to affect what you have planted from growing properly, common sense is remove it so that your plant can grow. But the owner said, no, no, don't do that, because in the rest of doing so, we may uproot what you have planted as well. Um, our Lord Jesus Christ was trying to describe the complexity of the, the extent of how when the enemy enters into a life, the how difficult it is sometimes to get rid of the enemy. Because you see, in the process of getting rid of the enemy, many them, that, 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 you, they may, you may incur some damages. And he says, you don't need to incur any damage. What you need is patience. What you need is patience. Now, if you look at it carefully, it's like a case of war between two worlds. There's a war between two worlds. There's a war between the owner of the farm and a war and between the enemy and a war between the seed, which is the wheat seed that the owner of the plant has planted and the tears that the enemy has come to plant. So you can see two different kind of wars going on. Now, Jesus here was trying to use something that we can understand 
to explain what we don't understand. He said the kingdom of God is lacking in other words. He used the kingdom, he said the kingdom of God is lacking. In other words, he was trying to say, let me use something that you don't understand, you understand to describe what you don't understand. I want you to understand that while he was talking at this time, he was talking to a group of people that, that were predominantly farmers. All they understand is agriculture. So he has to use what they understand to explain what they don't understand. I.e., if you sow a seed, you will harvest. If you don't sow a seed, you cannot harvest. So he's using something that everybody can understand to explain something that is so, so spiritual and beyond human comprehension. Now, before I go further on this, let me just digress a little bit and talk about sowing and reaping. Seed time and harvest time. I noticed one thing because things are going to start happening and I know that some people may, be, may start getting jealous of one person or the other and start saying, why is it this person? Why is it that person? Why not me and not the rest? You see, people shout, they don't really shout about seed, but they shout about harvest. They don't really shout about seed, but they shout about harvest. I want you to know one thing, beloved, that reaping is hard work. Sowing is also hard work. So if, you, if, if, if reaping is hard work and sowing is hard work, what it means is that sowing and reaping equals working and working. Hard work plus hard work. Because if sowing is hard work and reaping is hard work, if you join them together, it's like saying hard work plus hard work. Unfortunately for many believers, they believe opposite. They think uh, when you sow is when you uh, walk, and then when you are reaping, you are supposed to be relaxing. The thing about beloved is this is that you are going to, first of all, walk to sow. When you are sowing, it's hard work, sacrifice. And when it's time for harvest, you also have to go and walk. You have to walk to walk to reap the harvest. Now, the reason why I have I have to digress a bit to say this to you is because I noticed in PLM and for many believers that I've met, churchgoers, they believe in magic. You don't want to sow because of the pain that it involves. And then you want to reap. And even in your reaping, you don't want to work for it. You just want to, to come to your laps. Now, meaning, beloved, if you are to look at what man is doing in terms of their understanding about sowing and reaping, as a believer, most people don't even qualify to get anything because you, you are lazy in sowing and you are lazy in reaping. How do you make headway in life? And some believe that, look, you're right. If I sow a seed, which is considered hard work, or give an offering, which is also considered hard work, then when it's time to reap, I'm supposed to relax. I'm supposed to fold my hands. I've done the work already. But that's why you're wrong. You've got to be ready for hard work. Let me give you a very simple example. 
your parents have sowed good seed of character, good character in you. Send it to school and you've turned out very well in life. And it's all aim, it's all it's aimed at so that when it's time for you to when, when you have grown up and it's time to look for a job, you get a good job. And because you've gone to good schools and you come out with flying colors, you have worked hard to come out with flying colors. And then based on the character you have to, when it's time for marriage, let's say for a woman, you will be able to find a good suitor who will like you and like your character. So the good seed have been sown, you've gone to school, you've educated yourself, you've, you've, gone through, you've educated yourself, you have a good job, and then with your character, you have married a good man. And then you say, now that I have a good job and I'm married, I should now relax. That's why you're wrong. Now, you have reaped a good job. You have reaped, harvest a good husband based on the level of investment that your parents have put into it, terms of education and quality character. But to maintain that good job, is hard work. To maintain that marriage is hard work. Hard work in terms of getting to work early, doing what you have to do, sometimes working late, and then your marriage, cooking, feeding your children, taking care of them. So all these things, you realize it that both feed, both sowing and reaping is pure hard work. I hope you are getting what I'm saying this morning. So, even though you've worked hard to sow, you have to be ready to work hard to reap. Now, when the connections and opportunities start coming for the good seed that you have sown, in terms of education, in terms of good character, and the blessings that come in. It will require hard work. It takes hard work to keep a home. It takes hard work to keep a position and to get to continue to be promoted in the office. You see, what God does is that He rewards your seed with connections. Some people are waiting for money to come back. Uh, let me give you an instance. You, uh, Tunde has an association with me as my son. He works for the church. He's in charge of our videos. He's in charge of our tradition and everything. And he works. The other works. They are all doing exceptionally work. And then, and they're doing very well in their service to God. And when God wants to reward them, what God will do is that he will Connect them to the right people. People that will elevate them. People that will send help to them. Now, but when the connection comes, they can't kind of relax and fold their hands and say, well, uh, I can't. That is when another work starts. I hope you are making sense to you this morning. So God reward with the work they do. Both the, other and the work they do is a seed. But when God is going to reward, he will reward with connections, with open doors. But those open doors will require hard work. The same thing with all the pastors, the ministers. When they work for God, when you do things for God, when you sow a seed, when you sow an offering, what do I do for God sacrificially? When God is going to reward you, he's going to reward you with connections. But those connections will require Hard work. I hope you're getting what I'm saying this morning. So what am I trying to say? The blessings that you are going to get as a result of the seed that you have sown is as much hard work. It's, it's, it's equal, is hard work as well. God can send you the blessings. But if you don't work ethics to receive it, you will miss the blessing. Same thing with marriage. You could have been sowing good seed, doing all things and everything and all the rest. And then God now send you a good man. 
If you are not ready to work hard, you will lose that man. You are too lazy to cook. You are too lazy to do this. You are too lazy to do that. They tell you this. You say no. You are tired to look after children and everything. When will you not lose the man? So you see, it's work, 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 and work. That's why you say this world is a place we come to work. Heaven is a place of rest. So for those of you who think, oh, uh, being a Christian is all about relaxing and enjoying, you are making a big mistake. It's all about work. Our Lord Jesus Christ, all three spirit there on earth, worked throughout. So it's not a matter of sowing and relaxing. You see, God can give you a blessing that you don't have room enough to contain it. So, what does that mean? It means you have to work to make room. When Jesus told Peter, throw down your net for a catch, when they caught so much, they, it requires hard work to lift the catch to the boat. He had to get other people to support him. And then it's not only that, hard work to sell, to arrange, to arrange in sizes, to arrange in kilos, and all the rest. So it's all hard work, hard work, hard work. Both sowing and reaping. God can give you an opportunity. Blessing that you don't have character enough to receive. And that's why you need to work on your character. So, as a seed, you have sown. God is giving you a blessing that requires character to keep. Like a marriage, like a home. So, if that blessing comes now, and you are not ready to work on your character, to keep that blessing, you will lose the blessing. And then you continue to say, oh, God has not blessed me. He blessed you but you're not ready to work on what will make you to sustain the blessing. So, what am I saying this morning? I'm saying because some of you, when I said the end is near, I'm talking about God is going to start bringing connections and opportunities your way. But when the connection and opportunity comes, even in the midst of this pandemic, are you ready to work hard? I prayed to my daddy last week, before the summer, all through the night and during the week, last week. Daddy, please, make PLM, give, make us an exception. Let it be a birthday present for us, for our 20 years anniversary. Restore opportunities for my children. Bless them. Uh, open doors for them. When I was praying all this prayer, it's obvious that, beloved, that as if God is going to do this and as God is going to be doing this for you, you must be ready for the hard work that is required. Otherwise, the opportunities will come, the connections will come, but because you are not ready to work hard, you will lose it. And then you say, but the uh, pastor said God is going to restore that. He said God is going to Yes, he gave the opportunity. He gave the connection. But what did you do with the opportunity and the connection? I hope you are hearing me this morning. The strength of the crop determines the net worth of the owner. The strength of the seed and the crop when it grows will determine how rich and buoyant the owner will be by the time of harvest. If the crop is not good enough, then the net worth of the owner would diminish. In other words, if the crop lacks good quality and value, then the net worth of the owner will be reduced. So let me explain what I mean by that to you in plain language. The servant told the owner, the enemy has come to plant wheat, I mean, tears, alongside with the wheat you planted. And by so doing, it will affect the growth of the wheat. It will not make it grow properly. And during the time of harvest, we will not have quality crops. Why don't we, 
remove the tears so that the wheat can grow properly so we can have quality harvest. This was their own thinking. This is the way they were thinking. And it makes sense because the quality of the wheat will determine the, 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 the prosperity of the, uh, the owner at the end of the day. So the, the, the servants were thinking in his favor, let's do this. The enemy that came to plant the wheat, the, the, the tears also, also knows very well that by planting the tears, it will affect the growth of the wheat. And so therefore, the enemy, the, 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 the owner's harvest will be affected. He will not be able to make so much money. That was his own plan from the very beginning. That's why he planted the tears in the first place. But see, look at what the owner told the servants. He said, don't worry. Let them all grow together. Why? Why would you allow them to grow together? Knowing fully well that the tears is going to create a problem. It's going to be struggling with nutrients from the ground. With the wheat that you are planted. This is a parasite. You will not be struggling food with the wheat that you are planted. Making sure that they don't, they don't, they don't have enough nutrients so that they grow. What am I trying to say? And listen to me carefully. In those days, I used to worry. And I asked myself, where is it that, how come that with everything that you are hearing in church, you are still behaving the way you are behaving? Because my worry is that the kind of friends you keep, the people that you work with, can affect what you are hearing. And once they affect what you are hearing, it will affect the kind of result. The, the seeds or the fruits that will come out of your character. And don't forget that it's your character and everything that determines your prosperity in the long run. Not as much as your education. Education can get you a good job, but character will keep the job. Beauty can get you a husband, but character will keep the marriage. And so on and so forth. So I used to worry about, oh, they, 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 they will corrupt the word I planted into you, and then you start misbehaving. Before you know it, it will not give quality Fruits. I used to be my worry. But I understand better now. You know why? There is nothing as quality as the word of God. There is nothing as rich and solid and incorruptible as the word of God. It's incorruptible. The owner of the farm knew that the seed he planted is incorruptible. He knew that the seed he planted is strong. He knew that the seed he planted can fight any tear, can survive any, any circumstances. So he said, let the tears be doing whatever they want to do. I trust the strength of the seed that I planted. It's going to produce strong crops, and the crops are strong enough to fight for their nutrients, and they'll come out healthy. What am I trying to say, beloved? I cannot follow you to the world. I cannot follow you to the office. I cannot follow you everywhere you go. I cannot decide your friends for you. Even if I tell you I don't know what to do in your office. But if you are stupid enough to allow the world that you have had in church, which is incorruptible, and allow it to be corrupted by your stupid and funny friends in the world who tell you all manner of things on Instagram and everything, and thereby... You, 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 you water down the world and then it affects the fruits that you bring out which is no longer quality which is expected of what God expects you to be. You have only yourself to blame. Not me. Because I've sown into your ground the incorruptible word of God that if you are allowed to grow on the ground of your, on, of your soul it will produce good fruit but if you are allowed to be corrupted by the tears that's along, uh, that's the friends you meet in the world, and your own head knowledge, and your own idea, and your pride, and your arrogance, and you allow it to corrupt that world, to struggle nutrients. Rather than you feeding the word of God, meditating on it every day, you are meditating on the world, you are meditating on Instagram, you are meditating on all manner of worldliness. Things that cannot, it's like someone that wants to get married now. I feed you with the word of God. Good character beneath 
know how to cook, know how to look after the home. It's hard work. He asks your parents. It's hard work. Everything you have become to you was the hard work of your parents. You know, say, no, I don't want that one, no. I want to rest, too. Oh, I don't want to allow. I can't I rest. Then don't marry. Because it's hard work. You have to change that part. You have to look at, you have to have time. You cannot leave your children. That's why I'm against all parents who, I mean, it's amazing. The day in those days, my mother had only one house girl. For all of us. And it wasn't for us. You say it's to help her. Because when it comes to washing us, everything she did by herself. She did not leave us into the hands of the house girl. Today, you leave many of these like fashion. Nanny number one for number one child. Nanny number two for number two child. Nanny number three for number three child. And you know what? It's so bad that you don't even train these children. The turnover of nannies, the turnover. We have nannies are leaving my employment. is high in many places. Why? Because your children are rotten. You carry him and do this for him and do that for him and do this for him and do that for him. They want. They think they want to. Do they want to die? You know. Recently, I was asking myself. My son, the lady is just about how old now. If I did not raise a child, I would have been saying, "Ah, maybe I don't understand." I don't remember one time that he would say he would go to one place and break glass, or he want to go to. He, I didn't have that experience at all. Or like I see some children today, I want biscuits. If you don't beat them, they'll be crying. Okay, go and give it to him. Oh, give him your phone. Oh, let him play with it. I never had such experience. What I see today baffles me. So, like I'm saying, I don't know where you're getting all these feedbacks from, all these ideas from, but you also have so the right word of God into your life. I'm confident enough. I should be confident enough that that word should stand. Wherever you go, the word was sown into Joseph's life. He went to Egypt, he was not corrupted. The word was sown into Daniel's life. He went to Babylon, he was not corrupted. The word was sown into Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's life. They were not corrupted. They were young, they were not corrupted. They had the to be corrupted, but refused to be corrupted. If the word I've sown into your life is not enough to make you stand, then nothing can make you stand. I'm not going to kill myself. I'm not going to worry. I have told you what you need. See, beloved, many problems that you are crying to God to solve for you today, they are not problems that God, should, they, are not, they are not God's problem. They are not problems that God can solve. Not because he doesn't have the ability, but because it is not up to him. It is up to you. He has told you what to do. You refuse to do it. What will God do? That's the bottom line. And to you parents, I was talking to one lady, one, one, my, my daughter, she was telling me a few weeks ago. She said, Daddy, your generation and those above you are the ones that messed up the world. Because the values that you had, you did not pass to us. You did not enforce it to us. I can't understand. I was talking to um, the other one we were coming to, when we were coming to church, when we were coming from church. How many women today go to my How many young girls today, adults, can go to my to go and buy tomatoes? How many of them can go to the market to go and buy meat? All you do now is uh, shop right, um, uh, goodies. That's why you got to go and buy your meat. How do you how do you economize? How do you save money? In those days, I will carry my mother. To my 12, to Juwe, to Mushi, everywhere where they so to, to Simpson. We know where they buy the children. I, I, I take her to um, um what, what they call it, this place by Ocho, the expressway, where they do some Tuesday market there. I every and because she had to save money. In those days, your husband says, This is what I have. You know that's what he has. So it's in, the owner is on you to manage that resources. You go and buy things in bulk to the house and keep so that whatever. But today, you say the money is never enough for oh, it's not how would the man build a house? 
How will this how will they train children in school when all the money is used you have used for food and everything? Because you don't know how to economize, because you feel you are too you are too dainty to go to the market, to go and price. Ah, it's dirty, it's smelling. I can't go to that place. Who are you? Who the hell are you? Were you trained in the, in the Buckingham Palace? Are you trained better than the way I was trained? So we need to get this clear. We need to go back to the drawing table. We need to go back to basics. And I hope you are listening to me this morning. Because the truth of the matter is that this, 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 if nothing, if this, if the word of God does not change you, nothing can change you. Except you want to learn through affliction of life, and that would be very horrible. So this man, the farmer, knows the integrity of the seed he has planted, which is the word of God. Good seed. There is no question about the integrity of the seed. The seed is absolutely good. The word of God that I planted in your life is absolutely good. If you allow yourself to work with it and let it germinate, it will be a wonderful fruit, regardless of whoever it is that's around you. Regardless of the kind of friends you keep, that word will sustain you. That's the honest truth. The seed of the word of God is so good, beloved, that jealousy cannot kill. Envy cannot kill. Envious enemy cannot kill. The enemy said, if I don't do something to hinder the seed from going very well, it will grow well and increase the value of this man's kingdom. That was what made the enemy to come and plant those stairs. Let me plant something that will hinder the growth of the seed so that this man's wealth will not increase. That's why the Bible says, why men slept? The enemy came and planted tears among the wheat and went away. I will not be with you 24-7. While I'm not with you, while you're not in church, the enemy will come and plant all manner of seeds. When you leave this meeting, the enemy will say a lot of things to you. I'm not there. But I should be confident enough to know that the word that you have received is enough to keep, to, to, that it's incorruptible, that nobody can corrupt it. If I have to follow you everywhere, what, I mean, what would I do? It's, it's not possible. That's why, for those of you who have been taking the word of God for granted and have not been working with it, I hope from today you will be for your own good, in your own interest. Now, the tears planted among the wheat tells you the limitation of the enemy. The tears that the enemy has planted among the wheat that the farmer sow tells you the limitations of the enemy. What am I trying to say? He can only plant the tears. He cannot destroy the seed. If he had the plan, power to destroy the seed, he would not have bothered to plant the tears. He would have just gone straight to destroy the seed. What am I trying to say? The enemy cannot only offer you lie, but he cannot destroy the truth, which is the word of God. You can only he can only offer you lie. That's it. and if you, that's if you choose to respond to it, but the truth of the word of God will stand and will stand forever. So even the enemy has limitations. Where you are concerned, and I recognize that fact. That and that's why I'm confident. After I've spoken to you, I leave it, and I know because the truth will stand the test of time, any day, any time. If you like, don't follow it. If you like, follow it. If you follow it, it's for your own good. If you don't follow it well, it will judge you one day. Because I know that nothing can murder the truth. All the enemy could do was to plant tears, lies, the weeds. But they could not stop the seed, the wheat from growing. What I'm trying to say in context here is that nothing can kill the integrity of the word of God. I want you to know this morning that the God who has started the good things in your life is more than able to perfect it until the day of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Listen carefully, beloved, this morning. I'm not counting on the weather. I am not counting on the environment. I'm not counting on how it looks. As a servant of God. But I'm counting on the integrity of the word of God. That when he says the end is near, then the end is near. When he says the end of poverty is near, it's near. When he says the end of lack is near, it's near. When he says the end of unemployment is near, it's near. When he says the end of non-achievement is near, it's near. I'm not looking at the weather. I'm not looking at the environment. I'm not looking at circumstances. I'm only counting on the integrity of the word of God, which can never change. What are you counting on this morning? The lies of the enemy, what you are seeing, looking at it. Recently, in the last few weeks, or a week thereabout, all I've been seeing on WhatsApp is a girl, a 23-year-old girl, selling all manner of uh, love portion materials. And in one of the videos, she said, said people said to her, is this thing going to last forever? She said, you know, it won't last forever. It will wear one day. That's the truth about life. Life can never stand the test of time. One day it will fail. But the truth of the word of God will stand all the days. All days. And I want you to get that very, very clear this morning. For those of you who choose to lie to yourself, who depend on anything outside the word of God, but not the word of God, you are only playing with your future. It can only offer you temporary enjoyment. But if you walk with the word of God, it will require hard work, but then the difference is everlasting. If the word of God is right at the beginning, then it's going to be right at the end. If it is God in the beginning, it will be God at the end. If it was wheat when it was planted in the ground, it's going to be wheat when it brings forth fruit. No matter what the enemy has planted. Yes, the coming of the enemy into the story. All those things that comes to distract you or affect you from the word that you are hearing. Instagram. Your worldly friends. Your families who are not in Christ. All those worldly advices. All those things that come in to affect the word that you are hearing. Their job into the story of your life is not to destroy, is not to kill, is not to fight the integrity of the word of God because they cannot fight it. Because it's powerless against it. Their main agenda, let me tell you this morning, is to plant tears, doubt. Doubt. Hey, are you sure? Do you believe time is going? What like they did in Abraham and Sarah? To plant doubts into you. To affect the growth of the truth of the word of God in your life. The Bible says, faith come and bear hearing and hearing the word of God. To affect your faith. But they cannot fight the truth. One million Instagram comments, uh, suggestion cannot find, fight the truth. All your, uh, your, uh, your, your, your worldly friends and your 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 pagan family and all those who are unbelievers who use those worldly wisdom, everything that they say to you can never fight the truth. I challenge any one of you here this morning who can stand me face to face and say, Pastor, 
this word of God, the truth you told us. My, my, one of my family members have been able to say otherwise. I've been able to prove it wrong. I challenge you this morning. No matter what they say, the word of God will always be the word of God. The truth will always be the truth. You cannot destroy the word of God. You can only fight with it, but you cannot even win. If it was wheat when it went into the ground, if it was wheat, it would be wheat when it comes out of the ground. If you cut it, it will be wheat. If you boil it, it will be wheat. If you fry it, it will be wheat. If you roast it, it will be wheat. It will always be wheat at all times. That means no matter whatever you try to do to the word of God, the truth will remain the truth. If you like whatever you want to do, I need to stand. The enemy knew this. The world, of course, knows this. So what they do is to try to plant lies in terms of tears. Plant imposters. I miss the width because they know they couldn't destroy the integrity of the width. But let us plant something that will affect it, that will counter it. And once the truth is not prospering in your life, life will prosper. What am I trying to say this morning? The only people who can't dance with the new move of God in this realm and in this new year, are tears. Because if you're a wheat, if you're a wheat, that is, if the wheat of God of God has been sown into you, and you have allowed it to grow, and you have become a wheat, what I'm trying to say to you this morning is that no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise up against you in judgment shall be condemned. If you believe me and you receive it, shout in glory, hallelujah. If you are in God's ground and you are still dwelling on God's ground and dwelling on God's word, no matter whatever it is that you are going through, you are God's own child. You are God's child when you are broke. You are God's child when the many attacks you. You are God's child when the enemy comes and plants all manner of tears into your life. You are God's child when you are surrounded by witches. He says, no weapon fashion against you shall prosper, and every tongue that rises up against you shall be condemned. What am I trying to say, beloved? This situation that we have found ourselves cannot pull you down. The challenges of the world cannot pull you down. Unemployment that you suffer cannot pull you down. That sack cannot pull you down. That retrenchment cannot pull you down. God is fashioning a new thing for you. A new way. You cannot be pulled down. You will not be ashamed. And you will never be disgraced. If you say so, if you believe so, shout a glorious hallelujah and say amen. Beloved, I am asking you this morning, are you still a with? Or you have allowed yourself to be corrupted by the tears? Because if you are a with, standing on the seed of the word of God, you are incorruptible. Your harvest shall be bountifully. If you are broke, don't worry, you are a with. And if you are still a with, in other words, no matter whatever circumstances you find yourself, as long as you are you're still a with, standing on the word of God, dwelling on the word of God, I tell you, beloved, you will come out successful at the end of the day. If you believe so, shout in glorious hallelujah. So say to yourself this morning, even though I'm broke, I'm, I'm a with. Even though I'm sick, I'm still a with. Even if I'm rich, I'm still a with. I may be broke right now, busted, disgusted, but I'm coming out of this. That's what it means. 
I may be going through storms of life right now, but because I'm a wheat, I'm coming out of it. It doesn't matter the kind of challenges that the enemy is I'm facing going through right now as a result of lies and accusations that the enemy is planted all around me. I'm coming out of it because I'm still a wheat. I'm rejoicing this morning because I'm coming out of it. I'm still a wheat. And that's why I'm rejoicing with some of you, my children, this morning, because I know that that's why everything you are still standing and you are coming out of it. I rejoice with you because the end of your affliction is near. If you believe so, shout it, glorious idea. That's why you should start rejoicing. Forget what is happening. I don't know if I'm talking to you, but if I'm talking to you, say to yourself, Pastor is preaching to me. Tell yourself, Pastor is talking about me this morning. You may have been attacked all your life. You may have been frustrated. The enemies have made you look as if you don't have any value. But I want to let you know, beloved, for as long as you are still a standing on the word of God, beloved, you will come out triumphant in the mighty name of Jesus. You are a wish, you have value. You are standing on the word of God, you have value. You have been under attack, but you still have value. You are broke, but you still have value. You are employed, but you still have value. You are sick, but you still have value. And because you still have value, a child of God, you are coming out of it in the mighty name of Jesus. You see, that's why even the enemy is attacking you because you have value. In other words, no matter whatever circumstances, the world may put you through their lies, through their manipulation, through their deceit. No matter what the circumstances, they put you through by trying to plant fear into your life. Because you are still a witch standing on the word of God. You are going to come and triumphant in the mighty name of Jesus. And this is one thing many people cannot understand. When they say to you, why are you still going to that church? After all that happened to you, you are not employed, you are not married, you are still broke. Why? I want to let you know this something this morning. If you are born again by the word of God, your relationship with God is not based on material possessions. That's what the world doesn't understand. Why don't you have money? Why are you not married? Why you don't have this? Your relationship, if you are truly born again, your relationship with God is not based on material possessions. If you are hearing me, shout hallelujah. Your relationship with God is not based on what you have or what you don't have. Job said, naked I came, naked I will depart. The Lord give it, the Lord take it. Whatever I have lost doesn't have anything to do with my relationship with God. When you're a child of God, when you are born again, your relationship with God is not about what you have or what you are. It's not dependent on what you have or the situation you are in or the problem you are facing, whether in good times or in bad times, in sickness or in health. Your relationship with God will still remain intact. And that's why the enemy, what they don't understand. That's what your friends in the world don't understand. That's why your family don't understand. To them, everything must be about money, marriage, children, and all the rest. All that you stand to gain. Listen, the world cannot comprehend. Why for so long you have been trusting God for fruit of the womb, for marriage, for a husband, for a job? And you are still going to church. They can't understand it. And you are still going to that same church. I want you to know one thing, baby. True born again children of God understand that, and not one thing very carefully, that their relationship with God is not based on money or material possessions. It's not based on marriage. It's not based on anything. This is about the integrity of God's seed. Because to be born again, it should be begotten of the word of God. When you are begotten of the word of God, you are incorruptible. The word of God is the semen of God. It has the DNA of God. John is my son. If he's rich, he's my rich son. If he's poor, he's my poor son. No matter his condition or circumstances, he is my son. But he can never stop being my son because he is begotten of my seed. 
is because of my semen. So if my enemy cannot remove my weak status, why did he come? He comes obviously to devalue the harvest. Am I making? Am I talking on this morning? God, the enemy wants to devalue your harvest. He wants to shortchange your destiny. That's why he has come. This morning, I want you to look at the things that have been planted into your life to devalue your harvest. The lies, the manipulation, the deceit. I want you to think about it. The things, the people around you, the environment, the circumstances has been planted into your life to affect your faith in Christ Jesus. The main agenda of the weeds is to rob the soil of the nutrients that could have fed the weed to be mightier, fuller, richer, and hereby be able to produce more truth. The main agenda of the enemy by planting lies into your life is to rob you of the faith that you need to do exploits and to become who God has created you to be. Now the Bible says, why men slept? The enemy came and plied twist among this, the, 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 the wheat. He's not attacking the wheat. He's attacking the owner. Another point I want you to understand. Though he has planted the wheat and the wheat, to attack the wheat, the wheat has nothing to gain for being wheat. But the owner has something to gain for the wheat being what it is. God has a lot to gain by you and I being his children. Because we are here to do exploits for him. What am I trying to say? The attack is not really on us, it's on God. Devil is the enemy of God. So he's attacking us. So that our life will not produce the kind of dividends that God wants it to produce. So that we don't fulfill destiny and accomplish divine purpose. When the enemy attacks my child, he's attacking my child because of me. Because he doesn't want the harvest that I expect from the child to be bountiful. He wants to kill the harvest. Of my child coming out doing well in school, coming out as a graduate and whatever. That's why the battle, beloved, this morning is not your own. The battle is not my own. The battle is God's own. I've always said to parents, pray for your children. Pray, pray, pray. The attack on your child is an attack on you. And children, I want you to understand because many of you are so foolish to say, hey, it's, it's my life. The enemy is not attacking, he's attacking us. Understand very carefully that the attack on you is an attack on your parent. So it's not about your life. When you become a parent, you will understand and whatever I can do. Because the enemy knows once he gets you, he has gotten us. The devil knows that once he has gotten us, yes, he has, he, has, he, has, he has wanted to get God's attention. So maybe you have been thinking that the battle is yours. The devil is not attacking you. Rather, he's using your life to attack God. The battle is the Lord's. Nobody plants a seed without intention. Why did you plant? I don't know, I just did it. No, you must have a reason. You planted the corn because you want to harvest corn. You planted cucumber because you wanted to harvest cucumber. You planted tomatoes because you wanted to harvest tomatoes. That's what is called God's expectation of you. And it's based on the seed of his word that he has planted into your life. There's an expression of every one of you in promise and restoration ministry based on the seed that God has planted into you. And I want you to understand this fact. Maybe that's why the devil is after you. 
to sow weeds into the garden of your life to affect your faith, to lose divine purpose, to rob you of divine agenda. It is really not about you. It's about what God has put inside of you and what God wants to use you for. The enemy to become who God has created you to be is not an easy task, particularly if he has a very big agenda. Look at Joseph. Look at David. Look at Solomon. Look at Samson. And so on and so forth. And the greater the task, the greater the challenge. And before you enter into purpose, it's not easy. I realize that those that God has great plans for, there is always a delay before they enter purpose. They suffer the highest level of delay. To the point that sometimes people will say, forget it, look at Abraham. The purpose that God has for his child, look at the delay, 25 years. And the enemy actually even made it even longer when he sowed that seed to destroy his faith by going out with Haggai, who now became the greatest contender of the main seed today. Look at Joseph. Look at David. If you go to the Psalms of David, you will see that this was a man that went through a lot of attack before he became who God wanted him to be. His faith was attacked. At the point in time, he lost all his family. David had to go to prison. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. So for those of you that God has great place, man, that's what God says, those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. I hope I'm talking to someone this morning. If you believe I'm talking to someone next to you, tap the person and say, it is you, the pastor is talking to Tell the person again, it is you, pastor is talking to. If it's someone that you can pull the ear, I'm not talking about an elder, pull the ear, it is you, pastor, I hope you are listening. The enemy is attacking you, they are lying to you, they are making you fear because there is something about you. They know there is something valuable in your life. Thieves don't rob homeless people. Because there's nothing to steal. When you see a thief or robbers, there must be something valuable around there. The mere fact that the enemy is attacking you proves that you've got value. The Bible says, in fact, greater is the greater the attack, the greater the potential you are carrying. People who believe. People have gone through adversity. And I think going through adversity, right from your youth period, and even to now, I mean all your life, you have been under attack. I think you should begin to rejoice because it's a proof of how great you are. You know about Joseph's experience. He was caught up in a battle between two worlds. Caught up in a battle within two worlds. I want you to know this morning. But at the end of the day, he came out of it. Satan said, if you remove the edge around him, I promise you he will cause you to your face. God said, okay, let me prove you wrong. I will remove the edge. You can't touch anything but not his soul. All of a sudden, his purpose started crying. The people started crying. The crops started dying. His children started dying. Job got sick and every part of his body. Job lost his property. He lost his children. He lost the respect of his wife, his worth and value. But he never lost his integrity. Some of you are here this morning. You have lost so much to the enemy's attack. I don't care whatever you have lost. Please hold on to your integrity. You are who you are. Don't let anyone, don't let any situation affect your integrity. You have said you will continue to stand to the end. Make sure you stand to the end. The enemy is attacking that statement to see how long you can stand. 
But I want you to know that we've been in there for a night. Joy, come in the morning. Don't let anybody or situation affect your integrity. Your value is who you are. What God created you to be. Make sure you hold on to it. You might or may suffer just hold on to it. And because you hold on to your integrity when the storm is over, you will arise and shine again. I want you to tell somebody this morning, I'm coming out of this. I'm coming out of this. I'm coming out of this very, very soon. Beloved, God showed up for Job. And he said, Job is not over yet. God restored his fortunes. God gave him twice as much as he had before. Of all that he had lost. God blessed him so much that he forgot the pains of the past loss. The Lord blessed the later part of Job's life more than the former. Tell somebody this morning, I'm coming out of this mess. I'm coming out of this mess. Definitely the end is near. Glory be to the name of God. This is where we end this morning. Beloved, I, I want you to just bow down your heads and just appreciate God this morning and thank him for the word you have received. Thank him. Give him glory. Give him honor. Give him adoration. Thank him for his goodness. Thank him for his mercy. Thank you for his favor. Thank you for the word he has sent you this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Please stand up on your feet and take the following prayer points. By the power of the Almighty God, every battle against my progress, every battle against my life, Every battle against my destiny. In the name that's above every other name, I conquer. I receive, I receive victory in the mighty name of Jesus. I receive victory over you in the mighty name of Jesus. Every battle against my progress, my life, my joy, my peace, my happiness, my health, my children, my prosperity, my increase, my salvation, my integrity. I conquer you all in the mighty name of Jesus. I conquer you all by the power of the Almighty in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we are prayed. Say, as from today and for the rest of my life, I point the finger of God at all my problems. And I decree that in the name that's above every other name, die in the mighty name of Jesus. I point the finger of God at all my problems. Lack, poverty, non-achievement, failure, barrenness, impossibility. I point my, the finger of God upon you and I command you to die. End now in the mighty name of Jesus. Expire today in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. In the name that's above every other name, I delete my name from the list of failures in my generation, in my in mighty name of Jesus. In the name that's above every other name, I delete my name from the list of failures of my generation. In my generation, in the mighty name of Jesus, I will not be among those who failed in my generation. I delete my name from the list of failures in my generation, in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. As from today, by faith, I shall lend and not borrow again. In the mighty name of Jesus, open your mind and talk to God. I shall lend and not borrow again. Those who have been laughing at me will now come to celebrate me in the mighty name of Jesus. As from today, I shall lend and not borrow again. And all those who have been laughing with me will now come to celebrate with me in the mighty name of Jesus. As from today, I shall lend and not borrow again. 
and all those who have been laughing with me will have no choice but to come and celebrate with me in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we are prayed.